Not long ago, we made a video explaining the UK's housing crisis and explaining the main issues Britain had when it came to housing. If you haven't watched the video on the crisis yet, we recommend you do so because we'll be referring back to it a fair bit in this video. It's linked below. Anyway, after that video, we had a lot of people asking us for a follow-up on potential solutions to the crisis. So, here we are. Let's explain how Britain's housing nightmare could be solved. Before we do, if you too want to say in our video topics, then every video has a link to the topic suggestion form in the description. So whenever you come up with a topic you want explaining, send it our way. As I said, it's linked down below. So before we get into some possible solutions, we're going to look at the government's current policy and explain why it won't work. The government's policy is currently two-dimensional. It basically consists of expanding help to buy and reforming the planning system. Help to buy is great if you qualify for it, because it essentially means you get more money to buy a house. But, unsurprisingly, if you give would-be home buyers more money, you just inflate the cost of houses, and have to spend even more on help to buy for it to be effective. This is exactly what's happened. Help to buy originally started as a £250 million scheme restricted to first-time buyers, and has now been extended until 2023 at a total cost of £30 billion. The government's other policy is about reforming planning. As we mentioned in the housing crisis video, the UK currently uses a weird case-by-case -case planning system. In theory, reforming this would be a good idea because it would provide builders with more certainty, which would reduce speculative pressure on land and allow smaller builders to enter the currently oligopolistic market. Originally, the government wanted to do three things. Reform the green belt, increase local housing targets via an algorithm, and move to a zonal planning system. Unfortunately, rural Conservative voters hated the plans, because they didn't like the idea of more houses in their area or in the Green Belt, so prongs 1 and 2 got scrapped. The current planning bill still includes some stuff about zonal planning, but reports suggest that as many as 80 Conservative MPs are planning on voting against it, so it's unlikely to get through, and if it does, it won't make that much of a dent. So, what could work? Well, we should start off by saying that no one knows for sure. As we hopefully made clear in the previous video, the housing crisis is complicated, and smarter people than us are still currently arguing about the right way to go about fixing it. So, we're going to hedge our bets and look at three possible solutions, because, well, we apparently like doing things in threes. They are a 50% planning uplift tax, a land tax, and the so-called street votes policy. We're going to explain each policy and then present some arguments for and against it. Let's start with the planning uplift tax. Planning uplift essentially refers to the increase in value enjoyed when a piece of land receives planning permission. These uplifts are sensational. In 2015, the average hectare of agricultural land went from £21,000 to £1.95 million once planning was granted. At the moment, the state doesn't get any of this. It just hands over planning permission and the lucky landowner makes a killing. A 50% tax on this would mean that if I got planning permission, I would have to pay 50% of the increase in the value to the state. This tax would probably replace other indirect land value taxes, like the Community Infrastructure Levy and Section 106s, which require developers to build a certain amount of affordable housing. There are two main advantages to this tax. First, it should replace the speculative pressure on land values. Today, developers buy up land in the hope that it might get planning permission, and they can make a killing, drastically pushing up the price of land. Cutting their profits by 50% should reduce some of this pressure and mean lower house prices. Second, the tax will give local authorities more money to build social housing and improve local services and infrastructure. However, there are some potential downsides. First, there's the question of how you calculate planning uplift. Unless the developer puts it on the market right away after receiving planning permission, you can't really know how much for sure it's worth. This is why the UK uses stamp duty. It's paid at the point of sale, after you've decided how much the property is worth. Second, this tax has been tried before. In 1967, Harold Wilson implemented a 40% uplift tax, known as the Betterment Levy. Unfortunately, developers stopped applying for planning permission and just waited for a more developer-friendly Conservative government to come into power and scrap the tax, which is exactly what Ted Heath did in 1970. In 1976, Callaghan introduced an 80% development land tax, but again in 1979, Thatcher scrapped it. 
Essentially, this tax doesn't work if developers know that a new Conservative government will come along and scrap it, because then they just wait it out. This actually means less houses get built and house prices increase even more. However, some Conservatives today, notably former Housing Ministers Nick Bowles and Sajid Javid, have actually come out in favour of an uplift tax, which means that it might stand a chance of cross-party support in the future. The second option is a land value tax. Economists have been talking about land value taxes since Henry George's Progress and Poverty was released in 1879, but they've never really caught on. It's a simple enough idea. You make people pay a percentage of the value of their land each year. Most people suggest a land value tax of between 1 and 4%. So, if I owned £1 million worth of land, I'd pay somewhere between 10 and £40,000 per year. This tax would probably replace council tax, which is defined by the price of your house and the business rate system, which basically charges businesses owning commercial property. In theory, this tax should do two things. First, it should make holding undeveloped land less attractive, which will encourage developers to build houses faster. And second, it should bring down the overall price of land, making it easier for most people to buy houses. There are two main advantages to this tax. It's efficient and it's fair. Other taxes, like, say, income tax, are in some senses inefficient, because if you make the income tax too high, you make people less likely to work and you actually receive less revenue. A property tax would have a similar effect. At some level, it would actually discourage development. However, the supply of land is fixed, so a land tax won't have the same effect, because it's not like you could discourage the creation of land. This is why Milton Friedman, who was famously not keen on taxes, described the land value tax as the least bad tax. The land value is fair because, well, fundamentally, no one has more of a claim to the land than anyone else. It's not like either of us could have created that land, so how can I claim it as my own? Now, obviously, today, the land is yours because you bought it off the person who owned it before you, who bought it off the person before them, etc. But imagine the first person to claim that land. How could they justify that claim? How could it be more your land than mine? Anyway, one of the downsides to this policy is how do you calculate it? This probably isn't an insurmountable problem. Some countries, like Denmark, do use land value taxes, and they seem to be fine, but it would probably be a bit controversial to begin with. It would also be difficult for people who have big houses, but not enough actual money to pay the new tax. A possible solution here would be to allow bigger payments to be deferred until the property is sold, as in Denmark. However, perhaps the biggest obstacle to a land value tax is that it only hurts current landowners. Essentially, once the land value tax is announced, everyone who currently owns land will see a drop in the value of their assets, while future landowners will get to trade the land at this new, lower price. Now, this might not sound too bad. You're probably thinking of a whole load of wealthy boomers whose land has been increasing in value for the last 30 years. But imagine people who've been saving for years and have just made it onto the housing ladder only to see their assets' value wiped out. This is both intrinsically unfair and politically tricky. Nonetheless, any housing reform will have short-term political costs, so this shouldn't be seen as a sufficient reason to rule out a land value tax. The final solution comes from Policy Exchange, a UK think tank, and is known as the Street Votes Proposal. Essentially, the Street Votes Proposal says that the housing shortage is mostly caused by restrictive planning permission, and planning permission is so hard to get because residents don't want new buildings near them. They get ugly buildings, noisy construction, traffic congestion, and fewer places at GP surgeries and in schools. This means that, even in areas with low housing density, developers still can't build because locals don't want them to. The street vote solution to this problem is to give residents on a street the power to choose how their street is developed. Essentially, this turns every street into its own little planning permission authority. A proposal is submitted by 20% of the residents on the street or residents from 10 different houses, whichever's more. There's then a street-wide vote on the proposal, which passes if... 1. At least 60% of the votes cast are in favour. 2. At least one resident from at least 50% of households have voted. And 3. At least one resident in at least 50% of the voting households is in favour. The idea is that residents are more likely to agree to development if they get to choose it. Residents know their area better than anyone, and so are less likely to agree to ugly buildings. 
They'll also be financially incentivized to do this because a prettier street means higher property values and some street-wide developments could also include improvements to their own property. The proposal's authors estimate this could increase house building by 110,000 homes annually, which would translate into a 10% increase in total housing stock by 2035. If it works, this proposal could mean more and therefore cheaper houses, more beautiful streets and no sudden fall in homeowner wealth. There are, however, two possible problems with this proposal. First, it is possible that residents won't actually want to build more on their street, even if they've got a financial incentive. They might just like things the way they are, and be happy to sit on an asset that's already appreciating by 7% every year. Second, it's not clear that this will really solve the housing shortage, at least not in the short term. Most analyses agree that a 1% increase in housing stock would cut prices by less than 2%. It might be that the UK's housing backlog is too big to be solved by this sort of gradual policy, and something more drastic is required. What do you think though? Are any of these ideas enough? Is there an option we haven't considered? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and ring the bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name at the end of videos, then you too can back us on Patreon. The link's in the description below.